So, first of all, before the nice quote, um, I would like to say thanks to all the sponsors. I just forgot to add the session, uh, the slide of the sponsor, so sorry about it. But before we start with the, with the session itself, let's give it a bit of a funny quote. So, the cup of Drupal, everybody talks about it, um, nobody really knows how to do it. Everybody thinks everybody is doing it, so everybody say they're doing it. Um, if you know the original quote, so it's uh, some more better, but I just like censored the bad word. So basically, this uh, quote is the essence of this whole thing that called the cup of Drupal. Um, it came into our life like two years ago or four years ago, I don't know how much, and we don't have a list of good practices. We don't know how to do like this, like this. We just do it as we know from other front-end libraries. So if we'll take, for example, Lullabot site, which is actually a React application that talks with a CouchDB that have a Node.js server that Drupal send information into it or get information from Drupal, and it's kind of a mess with all what's going on. So the next question is, what is actually the couple Drupal? So I sit down like two minutes, one minute, half an hour, and I try to summarize into one good definition, which means everything that removed Drupal from generating your site's markup, and this is the most important thing, provide the content as an individual unit, which means the node that we give as node is not handled by the theme layer or the form layer or any other layer that we have in Drupal. So, although our presentation here is a bit unclear, but you can see that this is Drupal Israel Community Site, which is kind of old, and the last uh, post is from 2014. And we'll go through all the, all the way that I did to present it as an Angular application, which is a decouple from Drupal. So first, who am I? My name is Roy Segel. I'm coming from a small country named Israel. Today, I'm 27 years old. No need for applause yet. Um, for the past four years or five years, sorry, I am a senior developer at Gizra. And I've been working in the past couple of years with the Harvard University on the Open Scholar distribution, which is a distribution that helps Harvard to provide and display all their content in the site, starting from faculties, professors, and other important people on Harvard. We also work with the commerce guys, so if we have here a couple of, I don't think we have, but uh, we work with them on the commerce Kickstarter distribution. We also work with Acquia, and we're working with the European Union, which now doesn't have England inside it, if you are very updated with the news. And we're also working with the United Nations, so now you can give the real applause. <laughs> You don't need to, actually. Uh, so this is what we do for a living. What I'm doing for the fun is actually working on organic groups for Drupal 8, and I'm the co-maintainer of the method stack. So first of all, let's see how I approach to that project. So first, we need to I actually said let's talk about first on the API. But I'm not talking about all the function and the methods and the classes, but I'm actually talking about how all the endpoints that our application will uh, go into and ask information, which we can see, for example, blogs, comments, events, question terms, and so on. After I finish that uh, layer, I go on to work on how the API itself will need to be presented to the application, which you can see that we have, for example, the title and the date itself, and it's very understandable to, does, to everyone that doesn't know any computer science. Uh, and please remember this YML structure, it's very important to the next slides. Um, 
And after I have the API, let's think on the static markup of the site. So for that, we have a tool that's called Jekyll, which actually takes all the YML files and templates and converts it into an HTML markup, which is was the image we saw before. And it looks like this. Um, you can see that we have similar structure to an Angular, like we have the, uh, we can iterate over the data of the blogs and just present it in the static markup, which is a nice uh, way to present it to your customer or before you approach to your Drupal project at all, first finish your markup, so then it will be much more easy to start and work on your Drupal project, not just the couple sites. So now we need to know how to give this information to an application. So we have two strong competitors in our Drupal community, which is, which, sorry, which is, we need to know which one of them to choose. It's or RESTful or RESTWS. But first, let's start with RESTWS. Have anyone ever used here RESTWS to create application? Not RESTful, RESTWS. Okay, so it's have one main problem which is called Drupalism. As you can see, um, actually not, you can see that when we exposing our our node of stuff, we just provide the node itself. So if we remember the YML file before, I don't think our application can handle this ugly JSON file, which is, I don't care how the body looks like, if it's have a format or what's the safe value, or if I need the tags, I don't need to access another endpoint to just get it. I just want the term as I need it. So, on the other hand, we have RESTful. So the question is, will it solve all the problems? And the answer is no. But it will give you a much more easy job to uh, give information to your application. So for example, you can see that this endpoint looked similar to what we have before. You can see that we have ID and label and the tags themselves are actually tags and not just resource somewhere else. And you can see that in order to do that, we just need to extend a um, controller and just set and just define all the um, public fields that we want to expose in the way we want it. So, if we have a look on the question endpoint, for example, we can see that the field tags have these small process callbacks, which call process tags. And you can see that the function itself just returns an array or a single uh, term, which is much more easy to manipulate in case of, sorry, in uh, just not like RESTWS. So, now that we know how we present the information, we need to know what we lost when we go into the coupled site. So the first thing we lost is actually SEO. We don't have any clean URLs. We don't have a module that take care of all the SEO uh, method methodology and all the other stuff. And also, not all the search engines like Google and Bing and Yahoo can handle much um, a decoupled application. They just can't do it yet. Um, the other stuff that we lost is all the Drupal babysitting that we got from Drupal, which is all the view modes of nodes and the permission and the roles and the, and the routing that we get for free. And not least but most important, it's Form API that Form API is maybe bad for us, but it's very important to check that nobody messed the DOM of the forum or nobody hijacked the forum or hijacked the cookies or is even can actually validate all the form values themselves. So, next question is what we gain from this uh, Transition, transition. So the first is no form API. Yay! So let's take, for example, this lovely form when I go and paste a YouTube address. 
And you can see that when I'm pasting the address, I'm getting the description of the video and the small uh, embed with Im image and the label itself. And if we have to do it in from API, we'll probably throw the computer outside the window or just spend like a week or two just to get it right done. The next part that we gain is implementing JavaScript very easily. If, have ever anyone heard about Bower, for example? Bower is like the drush make for all the JavaScript libraries that we have. And for example, I'm just say that which application, which libraries I need, and all I need to do is just Bower install and Bower install and it's starting to download for me all the application, all the libraries I need. So just implement it in the site will be like this. Just copy the HTML file. And if anyone have looked on a normal Drupal site and want to say, hey, that library looks cool. I want it on my site. So he needs to check if he if someone ever implemented a Drupal implementation to that library and just starting to download more modules or more modules. And we just can say that, that this no more longer exists. Forget about it. It's very easy. And the last point is that we gain full control of the markup. Um, if you know Drupal just throwing you a lot of divs around elements or if you have views, then views also th cover all your uh, stuff with markups that you don't want. So if you're strict about your markup, so it's very fun to handle it. So I also want to talk about a nice technology called WebSockets. Everyone ever used WebSocket before? Okay, uh, one person you will get a cookie. This also get a cookie, and you also get a cookie. So, if you don't know what is WebSocket, let's imagine that Drupal.org is going to be a push notification site. So, for example, a push notification could probably be something like a JSON. Well, not that JSON, but this kind of JSON, which, in a hypothetical world, I send a message to Dries and I told him, "Would you like to come to Israel in September and have a kebab?" at the market and he said, yes, I thought about it and I would like to come to Rizal. So you can come to the kebab, it's very tasty. So what we can do, so we can like ask the server, hey, is there any new? And he'll say, no. So any new? No. And we can ask him again, any new? And he'll say, sure mate, so you have your JSON object. Do you know what's the problem about this one? Can everyone think about it? The problem is that it consumes too much time, too much resources, and if we are on a mobile device, we'll probably consume battery life and data uh, of the user. So what we can do to solve this one? But before I'll tell you how WebSock is going to fix it, we're going to know about two communication type. One is a half duplex, which means that each time uh, a request was done, then the other request can do. Just like a walkie-talkie, they say, do you have milk? And he say, yes. And you go to get your milk. But on the other hand, we have a full duplex, which means like a telephone number or a telephone call, sorry, that you say, hey, do you have milk? And you say, yes, come get, grab milk. So. For example, we have our, all the listeners that listen to this WebSocket server, and once I have a message, I can send them all the messages and they can know they have a message. Um, and the question is how Drupal join in to the party. Basically, we have our Drupal installation that send a message to the WebSockets, and the WebSockets send a message to everybody else. For this task, we used I use a, a service called Pusher, which is similar to all the other services like Firebase and Socket.io and other uh, services that I don't know of, which uh, is very easy, very fun, and, and that's it, I think, basically, about the service. Um, so we can see, for example, that I have, I have my setting of the Pusher of my credentials and I'm just doing a pusher trigger to a specific uh, event. So 
in the site, you can see that you actually are listened to an event, and if something will happen, you will do some operation. So let's see three cool demos. In the first one, you can see that someone is starting to write a message on the um, left side of the screen. And don't blink, but it will be very, very fast. You can see that instantaneously I got on the both of the screen a message. The next demo is about how I can do a small chat, like between, uh, I have a comment on the left side, and automatically the comment appears on both of the screen. Now the user will, um, just one second. And instantly you will get the message from the other side. And last but most cool is, you can see that I'm creating um, nodes from my terminal, and you can see that they were created, that appeared on the other screen, and I can see the node himself that was created. Um, and for the bottom line, can we replace a Drupal site? Can a decoupled site replace a normal Drupal site? And the answer is not yet. Sorry about this one, but um, if you have any question, you can ask now. Anyone? Okay. Yeah, sure, you. So this nice gentleman asked how we can validate values that send from an Angular form, right? So if you look at the REST W as the RESTful module, the RESTful module have an integration with a module called Entity Validation, Entity Validator, which can validate uh, each uh, entity. And you can say that, for example, the body itself need to be with the title with the content foo, and you actually can check the value, and if there is a problem, you can say set error on that field, and you will get a request back from Mustford that's, that return all the errors. And there is also an integration with RESTful forms, you know, with Angular forms, sorry, you can look at the RESTful module for that. And there is also, if you will do an option request, to that endpoint with RESTful, you will get all the information about the field, like what's the type, what it can have, how many uh, character it can have, and so on and so on. So you should check it out. So this young gentleman asked again if we have an authorization uh, process, and the answer is yes. In the RESTful module, we have something called RESTful token auth, that you will do an authentication against an endpoint, which will give you a token and an access and a refresh token. This token you will have to put on each request, and RESTful will take care to set the user object that's matched to that uh, token, and it will be invalidate will be valid for only 24 hours. After 24 hours, you will need to get like a refresh token, and you get a new token, and we get the process again. So we are using it. I used it for this one, but you can also pass cookies or any other authentication type that you want, which you can create a plugin for that. More question. Okay, so we can wrap this up. Thank you.